Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your welcome this morning. It's a while since I was last here, and uh, I was thinking about what I would talk about, and I thought, well, I better not give the the same sermon. There might be someone here who even remembers it. So um, we'll try something different this morning. Just let's bow our heads again before we start. (coughs) Our Father in heaven, we are very conscious this morning of our need of you, and in these troubled times in which we're living, we just pray today that as we study your word and your life, that we'll be encouraged to commit our way again to you and allow you to lead us and direct us now, I pray in Jesus' name. I try to keep in touch with some of my ex-colleagues who are Adventists. There's three of them, and we meet every now and then and have a sharing time. And my prayer is often that I can reach these guys, that they'll come back to Jesus and the truth that we believe in. Just recently, in fact, the last time that we we got together, there's only one turned up. And uh, I think that might have been God leading because we started talking away and he sort of opened up a bit and you could probably guess talking about all the problems in our world today. You've got to be uh, Rip Van Winkle not to realise the tremendous problems in our world today. And he made a very interesting statement. He said to me, the problem is we've departed from Christian principles. The Christian principles that we used to believe in, they guided us. And then he went on to assure me, I'm not a Christian anymore. I'm not too sure whether I'm an atheist or whether I'm an agnostic. So I thought this was an opportunity with a prayer in my heart to tell him why I still believed as a Christian and the message that we have. And I don't know if that's had any impression upon him, but I thought I'd like to share with you this morning a little bit in an expanded form what I told him and why I still believe in Jesus Christ. We're going to have a little bit of difficulty with technology this morning. I'm not connected up. But basically, there are only two explanations for life and our existence. This is pretty self-evident, but I just wanted to remind you this morning, there is only one, two solutions. One, God created. Now, for many people, and like my friend... It's too difficult for them to comprehend a God who has always existed and made everything. And let's face it, that takes faith. There's only one other reason, and that is we evolved. Life commenced in the primeval soup, and chemicals came together, and suddenly we had life. Now any of you who, I'm a biologist, anyone who has studied biology knows to fulfill all the requirements of life, they all have to come together in one instance, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just one small protein, like the haemoglobin protein, the chances of all those, what we call amino acids, coming together to give you that protein is 10 to 190. Do you know what that is? That's 10 with 190 noughts after it. That's one protein. And you need, in various estimates, many, many more proteins to all come together and all the other chemicals for life to occur. Now, some scientists, evolutionists, they're honest. And they admit that this is a seemingly impossibility. In fact, one famous scientist said, it takes faith. 
admitted that, but he said, I prefer to put my faith in this than in God. But the trouble is today, and even amongst some Adventists, many Christians want to have it both ways. They believe that God started the process off and he has been a benign supervisor of the process over millions of years till the la we have mankind or humankind. God clearly foresaw this because when he established the Sabbath, it was a one day to remember that in six days he created. Then he reminds us again in the Ten Commandments. And we know that Jesus kept the Sabbath, as was his custom, we're told. It was so important that he interrupted the plan of salvation to remain in the grave on the Sabbath. And the New Testament reminds us that he is the creator. And you can look those texts up. And of course, as Adventists, what do we believe in? The end time message is going to be to remind people that he is the creator. We are called to call people back to him as the creator. <clears throat> now, as Christians, we have an additional reason to have faith in a God. Anyone like to suggest that, what that is? Well, I'll tell you, the life of Jesus Christ. Now, how can this be? Now, many, many people, like my friend, believe that Jesus was a good man, but no different to Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius. No one else has had such an impact in our world. Our calendars are before Christ and Adam Domino after Christ. Well, we're trying to change that now. Now it's before the common era and now we live in the common era. And they say, well, look, all these stories about his resurrection and miracles just made up tales. And even more people are negative of because of what Christians have done in his name. And may I remind you, you mustn't look at our f fellow believers. We look to Christ. And the shame is that so many of us have misrepresented him. And where I'm coming this morning is that my faith was greatly strengthened when I visited the Bible lands in 2019 before COVID came along. And so the title of my talk this morning is I Walked Where Jesus Walked, and this I firmly believe. <coughs> Let's start, and this is going to be a very quick overview of all the places we visited and of their significance, all which testify to, to the, uh, the truth of the Bible. The birth in Bethlehem, and we know Joseph goes from Nazareth to Bethlehem to register. <clears throat> I thought I'd just show you here this morning. Here we have Nazareth in the first century when Jesus was on the earth, and now we have the current situation. You'll notice here, this colour here is the state of Israel. Well, it wasn't initially, but in the 57 war, they annexed more. And then in the 1973 Yom Kippur War, when they were attacked by the Arabs, they took over these Palestinian territories. Now, they're still self-governed, but they're under Israeli control and you don't get, dare go into those areas unless you've got um, the safe areas which the Israelis have kept. And you see that Jerusalem lies right in between the two, a very divided country. 
So here we have Nazareth, and down here we have Bethlehem. Now that's a fair distance. If you travel by car today, the quickest route is 150 kilometres, or if you take a slower route, it's 170. But it's about 100 kilometres as the crow flies. <coughs> and so we find that Joseph goes to Bethlehem to register. Just to show you there. Now the manger is not what I envisage. There's the church of nativity built over what they believe or tradition says was in fact where Jesus was born. It's actually a grotto and nothing like the medieval paintings that we see. <coughs> this over here is the church of the nativity. This happens to be a monastery, an Armenian monastery. The church here was built in 330, around about 330 by Constantine, over what was the traditional grotto where they believed that Jesus was born. It's shared today by three churches, the Greek Orthodox, the Armenian Orthodox, and the Catholics, uh, the Franciscans. This, however, was destroyed in 1529, and this is... Um, the current building. And what's of interest, you see the people standing here. These are the actual tiles of the, 300, the year 330 um, church. Now this is where you go to see the nativity scene. We didn't go in there. There was a queue a mile long. But these are the people coming out. And this grotto is down underneath the church. It's also a similar grotto nearby where Jerome translated uh, the Bible into the Vulgate. Now, this is only tradition. And there's another church, a Franciscan one, just a little way further. And there's another grotto just down below this. And they believe that this could be the actual grotto where Jesus was born. And so they've set up here the nativity scene and people come and worship here. <coughs> Oops, pushed the wrong one, didn't I? The next thing that of a major importance was the baptism. Bethany beyond Jordan. Jesus would have to have gone down the Jericho Road. The Jericho Road is about 27 kilometres from Jerusalem and it drops one kilometre in height down to... 800 metres below sea level. In Roman times, this road went down what we call Wadi Quelt, which is just a gully where the water runs. And Jesus would have walked down this wadi to the baptism. It was the only route to Jericho, and he would have walked down that. Now, our group had the opportunity to walk down this, so let me just point out the details. Here is Jerusalem. Now, we don't know whether he came from Nazareth or where, but we know that he would have had to go down this road to Jericho and the Jordan River over here. Now, this is the Jericho Road. It doesn't look very steep, but it goes down fairly gradually. We're not too sure if it's exactly... The, uh, the road in Roman times. This here is, all this is the water catchment to catch water. But this, where the arrows are, is the Jericho Road of Roman times. I just wanted to show you here, this is the road that we were walking on, but you can see up here signs of, of human activity and may well be that's where the Roman road was. It was a very dangerous road. It was called the Blood Road. And it was the road where the Good Samaritan story is depicted. And you'll see as you go down, there are many, many caves. And the robbers used to hide in these caves and then come down and attack unwary people. We walked down this road, not right from Jerusalem, but right down Wadi Quilt. And... Uh, 
We were glad it was very, it was downhill. It was 44 degrees. And uh, you can imagine walking up that in 44 degrees heat. But this was the main road from Jericho to Jerusalem. I don't know where that's come from. That's not my slide. Oops. Perhaps we're speaking in tongues now. <laughs> now, it's not showing up awfully clearly here. But what we're doing, we're in Jordan and we're looking over to the hills of which Jerusalem is up on the top and you can see what is modern Jericho at the bottom. You can see the remains and we did visit the remains of what they think was the original uh, Jericho but this is the city today. And here are some steps down into the Jordan River and you go down to the Jordan River and here we are, my, the group I'm with is sitting on the east bank in Jordan, looking across to the west bank, which is controlled by Palestinians, and you'll see there's some evangelical Christians over there, and they were rebaptizing themselves. Uh, they were scooping up waters in a bucket and tipping them over each other. This is the mighty Jordan River. At this point, 10 meters wide and about two meters deep. It floods, of course, three to four meters higher. This is a traditional site where the Jews believe that the Israelis crossed over into the Promised Land. And this is also where we believe that perhaps Jesus, uh, um, John was baptizing when Jesus was baptized. Maybe not exactly here, but certainly somewhere along this stretch of water because he would have come from Jericho. It's very much recognised as the area. There are 24 churches built around this area. This one is a Greek Orthodox one and it was very interesting. <laughs> Didn't make much impression upon me at the time, but he, um, the guide said to me, he was Pastor Peter Roenfeld, if you look over you'll see a golden dome. He said that is the Russian Orthodox Church, which was recently completed in 2012. And why I'm mentioning it is, it was opened by no less than her Vladimir Putin. So what do people do in the name of Christianity? We only have to look at the Ukrainian war. And the Russian Orthodox Church is supporting Vladimir Putin the hand in glove. Just a few other churches I snapped as we travelled out of the bus window. So now we move on. We don't know what happened after the baptism except we are told that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted. And once again we come back to our picture and you can see here approximately somewhere there is where the baptism occurred and if your eyes are good you'll notice down here the wilderness and this is the wilderness where Jesus would have been led to at what particular point there we don't know and where he was tempted so as we travel along you can see it's pretty much a desert a wilderness if you're lucky you might get 145 millimeters a year in this part of the world and as you travel along and this is, by the way, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And we haven't got time to show pictures there. But you'll notice, as you travel along, there's lots and lots of caves. And so probably in one of these caves where Jesus might have been, we know also in this same area is where David was hiding from Saul and where he had the opportunity that he could have killed King Saul. But there's also wadis. And just nearby here's a wadi with fresh spring water coming down all the time. Then the next thing we know we, is recorded that after the temptation, um, he went to Galilee and lived in Capernaum, just after John the Baptist's death. <clears throat> so here we have modern Galilee up here. And this is now looking over 
the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is about at the widest 13 kilometres and about 21 kilometres in length. And so we're now on the west side looking across to the eastern side which is the Golden Heights which you've probably heard of which has um, been a contentious point in modern times. Just going back, just down in this area there was a drought some years ago and they found a bit of a boat sticking up out of the, of the, of the, of the mud and that and they excavated and they reconstructed, uh, dried it out and this is the remains of a boat of the first century. So this would have been a similar sized boat to what Jesus would have sailed in with the disciples. It's a first century boat, they know that. It's huge. It's um, 2.3 uh, metres wide and 8.3 metres long. And you might think, well, you don't need to have to worry about that because uh, we notice that uh, the Sea of Galilee is pretty calm, but it can change very, very quickly. And even at near the end of this day, the wind started to come down and it started to get a bit choppy, but you can get very, very rough. What we're looking at now is the southern tip of the Sea of Galilee, and you can see here some vegetation and this is where the Jordan River leaves and goes on its way to the Dead Sea. It's pretty big up here too, you can see. Mighty Jordan Roll. It's not a very big river, is it? But what a lot of history. So let's have a quick look at the Galilean ministry. We're told that he went to Capernaum. There's no such place today as Capernaum. You won't find it on the map, uh, in, on a modern map. But they have excavated, <clears throat> and it's partly excavated, and the estimate is that there would have been about 5,000 people in Christ's time living there in Capernaum. And so we're out on the Sea of Galilee, and you can just see, if you're very good, at the bottom of the arrow there, a church, and this church is where uh, they've been excavating. Here is just a few of the excavations. These are houses. Tradition says that this is Peter's house. There's no absolute evidence of that at all. But typically, this is what it would have been like. The other very interesting thing, as was his custom, we're told Jesus went to the synagogue. And this is the site of a synagogue uh, that was present uh, in uh, biblical times and this is a first century um, over this is, a, is a, a later synagogue that was built but this is the site of, of the synagogue in Jesus' time. What happened there? He healed the Capernaum official son. He drove out evil spirits from the man in the synagogue. He healed Peter's mother-in-law the healed man lowered through the roof, healed the centurion servant, healed Jairus' daughter and uh, the suffering woman, and the call of Matthew. And this is where he discusses the bread of life. We move on, and the next point of the ministry is Bethesda. Once again, there's nothing there. No, there's nothing to excavate. There's a bit of pottery and a few other things marking the site, but... There's nothing worthwhile going to see there. But an important point is that it was the birthplace of Philip, Peter and Andrew. Jesus fed the 5,000 near Bethsaida. Uh, some traditional people say it was elsewhere, but if you read uh, Luke's record, it says it was in the area of Bethsaida. <clears throat> and after that, the disciples left by boat to go towards Capernaum and this is where Jesus walked on the water and this is also where he healed the blind man. The next point of ministry you want to look at is Cursi. It's, there is a place called Cursi now. It's not mentioned in the Bible but it's the traditional site 
or where Jesus cast out the unclean spirits through the demoniac into the swine. And there's a ruins of a 5th century monastery there, and we were just looking at the ruins. The interesting thing for me was there was a baptistry. They did baptise by immersion. So you say, that doesn't look as though you could do that, but you were actually dunked down like this. But it was complete immersion back in the, in the 5th century. And so we move on, and now the Sermon on the Mount, where he got, uh, Jesus gave the Beatitudes, this is the traditional site. We can't guarantee, but it fits all the, um, the boxes, ticks all the boxes. There's now a Franciscan monastery there now, and you can see where the arrow is, where the monastery is. Don't take any notice of this. This is just shade cloth over banana trees. And now we're up on the Franciscan Monastery and we're now looking um, eastwards to the Golan Heights. Very lush. The reason being is that there's a permanent spring there. And this is typical of Palestine. There are permanent springs in many places. I was very touched by this. You probably can't read it, so I'm going to magnify it for you. And it says, Let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink Whoever believes in me, as scripture says, rivers of living water flow from within him. And as you go along the footpath, at regular intervals, there are little plaques reminding us of the Beatitudes. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Now another very interesting site we visited is Magdala. <coughs> Magdala is only mentioned once in the Bible. It says that Jesus sailed there after feeding the 4,000 and this was somewhere down in Decapolis here so he would have sailed up here and landed here. <coughs> now many people said, you know, another bit of mythology, there's no such place as Magdala. It was, wasn't known to exist. And then, uh, what year was it? In 20... Uh, I've forgotten the year now. Uh, hmm. 2000, uh, 2007, I think it was, they were going to excavate to build a resort. And they suddenly found that they hit... Oh, 2009, I'm sorry. I didn't have to remember after all, did I? And they excavated and found all these ruins. And the interesting thing is that this is the, this is the ruins of a first century synagogue. These are the original tiles on the ground here. And just another site of the uh, synagogue. And we know it's a synagogue because here is a menorah on one of the, uh, the, the things that were in there. I won't show you all the excavations, but for me, the really outstanding telling point for me was this is the original paving of the road. If Jesus went to Magdala, he would have had to walk from the wharf up this path. And there's a church being built here, and you can see depicted here the disciples or Jesus' feet walking on this path. And this is where I bring the title of my sermon. Because I walked on these stones. And I walked where Jesus walked. We want to skip now to Jerusalem. I don't know what's happening there. Must be your computer up there, Neil. Here we are on the Mount of Olives looking over a cemetery towards Jerusalem, the old Jerusalem. And this is what we call the Temple Mount. This is the most sacred place for Jews because they believe this is where Solomon's temple was built. <coughs> and then when that was destroyed, Zerubbabel's temple was built and later improved on by Herod before destruction by the Romans. And you can see the contention that goes on in this part of the world. What's on the Temple Mount? A mosque. And this is the third most sacred place 
in, in Muslims is here because they believe that Muhammad went to heaven and came back again. And they actually have control of that. They will allow other people to go there. Jews are not allowed to pray there, by the way. Now, if we come and look the other direction, you can see once again where the Temple Mount is. And here's the Wailing Wall. Because <coughs> this is, they believe the remains up to here of the wall of the temple in uh, biblical times when, uh, when Herod did some renovations to it. And this is where the Jews wail for the lost temple. I don't know what's happening with that. Never mind. Now, this is very significant. And if you want to read about this, it's in the December issue 2019 of the National Geographic. And we were very fortunate because they just excavated this earlier, we were there earlier in 2019. And these, this was excavation underneath the, the old city of Jerusalem. And you can see all the, the uh, supports holding it up so the, the, the roof doesn't collapse. These are the steps from the Pool of Siloam. The Pool of Siloam is dry today, but these are the steps... This is where the priests would have walked down for ritual cleansing before they went up to the temple on the, up above on the Temple Mount. This would have been where Jesus walked after he um, healed the man, the leper, the uh, cripple. I've walked up here, and once again, I'm convinced. What's going on? I walked where Jesus walked. Jesus would have walked on these steps. Man alive. <laughs> What's going on? Anyway, excavations, they believe this could be the steps that led up to Caiaphas' palace or residence where Jesus was taken. Now, this is inside. I don't know what's going on. Never mind. <coughs> uh, we'll just go back. This is a hole in the floor. They've built a, um, a church over it now. The re significance of this is that the high priest would not meet a criminal. He would be contaminated. And so Jesus would have probably been lowered down here and then interrogated. And when it was found that he was not a common criminal, then he could be investigated uh, by Caiaphas. And these are the Caiaphas rooms down here. Now, very significantly, just outside this uh, church, there is this column. And this denotes where Peter denies Jesus three times and you can see Peter here and the maid uh, to the two maids and the soldier whom he denied having known Jesus and here of course is the rooster and in the background you can see the temple mount we now come to the crucifixion and death we don't know the exact exact site of the crucifixion we don't know the site of the burial this is a traditional uh, tomb that would have been like that except there's no stone in front and inside you can see an empty tomb now what sets Christianity apart from other religions is that early Christians didn't erect a monument on the tomb why? there was no body other religions have monuments where their leaders' tombs are. Here we have Muhammad's tomb in Medina. Here we have uh, Buddha's re uh, the stupa of the Buddha's remains in Kushan Nagar in India. Why no tomb for Jesus? There's no body. The tomb was empty. Why an empty tomb? 
Well, non-believers say that the disciples stole the body. There's nothing new about this. Matthew records this. Some of the temple police who had been guarding the tomb went to the chief priests and told them what had happened. A meeting of all the Jewish leaders was called and it was decided to bribe the police to say that they had all been asleep when Jesus' followers came during the night and stole his body. If you were on guard and that happened, you got the death penalty. And so the Jewish leader said, if the governor hears about this, the council promises we will stand up for you and everything will be all right. The story spread widely and is believed today, to this very day, and that's true. People like my friend, that's what they believe. He was a good man, but, you know, his resurrection was rigged. How likely is this? Where were the disciples at the time of the trial? They hold up for the fear of their lives in an upper room, for fear they might be identified and suffered the same fate as Jesus. Peter denied him didn't want to be identified him. So what changed the disciples from being frightened to even be identified as a follower of Jesus to be willing to go and to die for him? What convinced them that they are willing to make this sacrifice? You steal the body and then claim to he uh, are willing to die for that to say it was he was risen? Is that very likely? Do you die for a lie? Not likely at all. The other theory is that robbers stole the body. Have you heard that one? All right, how likely is that? Why do robbers rob graves for valuable things? A very valuable thing in those days was cloth. You might remember the Roman soldiers were casting lots for Jesus' robe. So what do you find? The record tells us that when they went into the tomb, the linen was neatly folded. It was valuable. The robbers would have taken that. Or if they'd taken the whole body, they certainly wouldn't have folded the linen and left it. So that's not a very likely story either. We're left with only one conclusion. Jesus rose from the dead. And that is one of the most telling points as far as I'm concerned to be a Christian is the life and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was no man. After Christ's resurrection, John, Peter and five other disciples went back to their trade of fishing. Now, this is an interesting one. Once again, it's a traditional site. But here is the Sermon on the Mount traditional site and down here you can see a church and this is the traditional site where Jesus appeared after the resurrection to the disciples that were fishing I think the battery might be getting flat Oops. and there's the church now here I am pointing to why they think this might be the real site. You can see in the distance some boats. Oh, come on. What are these boats doing? They're actually fishing because at this very point there's a permanent spring that comes into the uh, uh, Sea of Galilee bringing nutrients and the fish a swarm around there. So it could be a likely spot where they, in fact, were fishing when Jesus, after he rose from the dead, came and met them. (laughs) 
You might remember that three times Jesus says to Peter, Son of John, do you truly love me? Why three times? Because he denied Christ three times. So three times he asked this question. Three times Peter says yes. And Jesus replies, first of all, feed my lambs. Secondly, take care of my sheep. And thirdly, feed my sheep. Christ's final injunction to Peter and all disciples is, what? Follow me. And it's the same challenge for all disciples today, that we are to follow him. We next know that Jesus walked towards Bethany, lifted up his hands and blessed them, and then ascended. Luke tells us more in Acts. Two white men said, This same Jesus shall so come in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And as Adventists, this is what we are looking for. And this is what sets us apart, the second advent of Jesus. The challenge for me was, with all the miracles and the resurrection, the Jews mainly were not ready for the first advent. In spite of all the evidence that they had of the miracles, they chose to deny him, and even after the resurrection, the Jews overall did not follow Jesus. So the challenge for me today is to get this to work. Could we, ourselves, with the evidence that we have, not be ready for the second coming? And these challenging times in which we're living, we are told, therefore ye must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at a now you do not expect. The parable of the ten virgins is about Adventists, all waiting for the coming of the bridegroom. Half were ready and half weren't. With all that's happening in the world today, we need to ask ourselves, am I ready? And that's a challenge I leave with you this morning. Are you ready?